Welcome everyone to Mounts of Mayhem! I know why you're here, this update broke a lot of things. So without further ado, let's just jump right into it. If you had a data pack that was working in the previous version, which at this point would be Minecraft 1.21.10, then this video will show you how to get that same pack working again in the new version, 1.21.11, Mounts of Mayhem. Let's go for it. First off, we've got a change to item atlases. Now at its core, this is a resource pack change, but it might also be affecting your data pack if you are doing something like using a text component to show an item sprite. So before, all images that fell under the categories of both blocks and items used the Minecraft blocks atlas. The change is that blocks and items have been split into different atlases. So if you were using the blocks atlas to reference a sprite belonging to an item, you now have to use the items atlas instead. And as you can see, if I run this new form of the command in this new version, then I'll get my item sprite displaying on screen. Now keep in mind that if you were using a sprite belonging to a block, then the blocks atlas still exists and that is still what you need to use, so this will still work. Alright, and next up we've got a change to the way that mob anger works. And now this one's gonna be pretty special for me because this was actually the subject of the very first video I ever posted on this channel, all the way back in Minecraft 1.16. Finally, after all these years, this system is getting an overhaul. Now the subject of that video was getting one type of mob to attack another type of mob, and in my video I specifically used the example of a zombie piglin attacking <laughs> attacking a cow. So as you can see, after I pressed that button, the zombie piglin got mad at the cow and killed it. In the previous version, the way you might have done that was to take the zombie piglin, set its anger time up to, you know, the highest possible value allowed by an integer, which is what this number is, and then take the UUID of the cow and paste it into angry at under the zombified piglin. And that would be enough to get the piglin mad at the cow. Now the process in this new version is almost identical, but there are a couple key differences. First of all, angry at is now named in snake case instead of camel case. Other than that, it acts exactly the same way, you just have to change the name of the nbt field. And then you might also notice something a little bit different about this first command. Before we had anger time and it accepted an integer, so I put in the max int value. Well now what we have is anger end time and it accepts a long, so I went ahead and put in the max long value. Now anger end time, as the name suggests, doesn't act exactly the same way anger time did. Anger time was a literal countdown. So if, for example, I had put anger time 20 here, that's 20 ticks, and the mob would no longer be angry after 20 ticks or one second. But with anger end time in the new version, you have to put in the ID of the tick on which the anger will end. Now this number does not count down, but if the game time ever reaches the this value, then both of these fields are removed and the anger ends. Now the reason I put in the max long value is because this is a time that the game is just never ever going to reach, so if you do this, then that will keep the mob angry indefinitely. Now you may be asking, what if I really do want the mob to only be angry for some temporary short period of time? So what if I really did want the piglin to only be angry for 200 ticks or 10 seconds? Well this is how I would have done that before, but in the new version I have to literally get the current game time, so like using slash time, query, game time, and that will actually return the current time in ticks right there. You'd have to use that command with execute store, add however much time you want to make the mob angry for to that number, and then store that number under anger end time. So it is a little bit more involved, but if you really want to do it that way, that is how you do it. All right, and up next we have a change to consumable items, and specifically items that have been given an animation when you right-click with them. This was a topic of another one of my videos from the past, and in that video we covered how if you use the consumable component, you can set the consume seconds up to really, really high, turn off the particles, make it have no sound, and then you can also give that item an animation. And in the previous version, if you specified animation as spear, then while you were right-clicking with this item, you would hold it up as if you were about to throw a trident, just like this. Now the change is that because spears were added, the spear animation now makes the item animate like those new spears. So if you want to keep the behavior from the previous version, if you were using the spear animation in the past, you now have to use the trident animation, which is actually what I'm using on this item right here. This is what Spear used to do before, and it's what Trident does now. If you keep it as just Spear, then the animation will change to this, which is a little bit different. It still has an animation, but it's just different from before, so it's up to you if you want to keep it or change it back to the way it was before. Next up, we've got a change to the world border, and specifically the animations that occur when the world border moves. Now first and foremost, the world border no longer moves according to real world time, it now moves according to game time. And according to Mojang, there is a possible breaking change here if you were using the world border specifically to track real world time. If that's what you were doing, well there is now a much 
easier and better way to track real world time, and that is with the brand new slash stopwatch command. You have stopwatch, create, query, remove, and restart, and you can also test existing stopwatches with execute if stopwatch. Now each use case for this is different, so I'll just go ahead and leave a link to the page about the stopwatch command in the description below if you want to read about it, figure out what it does, and how to use it for yourself. Because I'm going to move on to the actual change involving some of the world border commands. If you were using the world border command to either set or add distance to the world border, and you had these time arguments on the end, you now have to add s's after those time arguments. The reason for this is because the world border now accepts time arguments in, you know, the tsd format, which defaults to accepting a number in ticks. So this command right here in the previous version was actually specifying to animate the world border over the course of 20 seconds, whereas in the new version this command will be interpreted as 20 ticks. And same down here, this was 5 seconds before and it's interpreted as 5 ticks now for both set and add. So to keep it as seconds you just put s's on the end. Next up we've got a very small change to item modifiers, and specifically just this type of modifier called filtered. Now how this one works is it runs an item predicate on whatever item it's modifying and only actually applies the modifier if that predicate passes, right? So this particular modifier would look only for bricks and then change their name to filtered item. The change is that this name modifier here has been changed to on pass, and that's literally it. Again, it's only if you were using this filtered type. This one might seem silly, but the reason for this change is because they've also added an option for on fail. So if you want to, you can specify another one of these that's on fail, and that modifier will only pass if the item filter doesn't pass, which is cool brand new functionality that just happened to mess with the existing behavior a little bit because of the name. Okay, and our next change is going to be a pretty big one. I would not be surprised if this applies to a whole lot of people, and I would not be surprised if a lot of people are slightly upset about this one. The change is that the entire game rule system has been reworked. So if I type slash game rule, you can see that all the game rule suggestions look different than they did before. The change is that every single game rule has been switched over from its previous hard-coded value to a registry with a namespaced key. Now registries with namespaced keys always have to be snake case instead of camel case. So for the vast majority of game rules, they've basically just kept their name the same, but now they're, they're under the Minecraft namespace, so you can optionally specify Minecraft before them, and they've been changed from camel case like this to snake case like this, with no capitals and underscores in between words. Now that's true for most game rules with a pretty big list of exceptions, and here is that list of exceptions. You can pause the video to read them all, or go ahead and download this example data pack from the description below, as always. But if a game rule does not appear in this list, then it just basically followed this rule where it went from camel case to snake case. Now aside from that, there are a couple of minor changes to the way some of these game rules actually work. So there were three boolean game rules that have had their values inverted. We had disable elytra movement check, disable player movement check, and disable raids, which were all changed to just not have the word disable in front of them. They were changed to these three right here. And so if disable disable elytra movement check was true, then elytra movement check is now false and vice versa, and likewise for these other two as well. There are a couple changes to some integer rules as well, and namely they have been uh, capped to have max and min values that are allowed on them. So like for example max block modifications, which was previously uh, command modification block limit, which I think is right here, yeah there we go. This one now no longer accepts a value lower than 1, and then this one max snow accumulation height doesn't accept a value lower than 0 or higher than 8. So like for example if you were setting this game rule to something outside that range that's just no longer allowed. And here are all the rules that have been applied to integer game rules in that way. Now finally last but not least there were two boolean game rules before that no longer exist and have been merged into a new one. So do fire tick and allow fire ticks away from player which were both booleans no longer exist in the game. The new game rule is fire spread radius around player which is an integer that accepts the number of blocks away from the player that fire is allowed to spread. Now the previous values of those other boolean fire game rules map onto this new one in the following ways. If do fire tick was false, then fire spread radius around player is zero, which prevents fire from spreading at all. If do fire tick was true, and also allow fire ticks away from player was true, that corresponds to the new game rule having a value of negative one. If it's negative one, that means fire can spread everywhere. I guess as long as the chunks are 
are loaded. Now finally, if do fire tick was true and allow fire ticks away from player was false, which were their default values before, then that corresponds to the default value of the new game rule, which is 128. Fire can tick up to 128 blocks away from the player by default. So those are the overhauls to game rules, and with the overhauls to game rules came a slight overhaul to the one other thing in the game that relies on game rules pretty regularly, that being game tests. Now, if you're not sure what a game test is, game tests are a system added, I don't know, a year or so ago that involved these really weird looking blocks. I made a video about them at the time and still have never actually found a use for them myself, but I can tell that they're pretty useful to the devs. But if for some reason you as a datapack creator are actually making use of these, then there was a pretty big change to the game rule type of test environment. Again, on account of the big change to game rules. So before we had these two fields that were bool rules and int rules, and then each one of those was like a list of objects, where each object was a rule with the name of the rule and then the value. Now this system has been entirely overhauled and greatly simplified. There's now just one key called rules. It's no longer a list of objects, it's just a single object where the keys are the name of the game rules and then their values are those game rules values. And you can put both boolean rules and int rules here. Now also keep in mind that the names of the game rules were changed as we've already covered. I doubt anyone who watches these videos even uses test environments, so we're going to move on from that right now to the last and probably biggest change, which starts with a couple of vanilla asset changes. So first of all, an enchantment tag was renamed. The enchantable slash sword tag is now enchantable slash sweeping. And now, rather than controlling enchantability for every single sword enchantment, it only controls enchantability for sweeping edge. The tag that now controls enchantability for all the other sword enchantments, like sharpness and stuff, is now enchantable slash melee weapon, and this one includes both swords and spears. So again, depending on what you were doing with that tag, you can either go to sweeping or to melee weapon and just be aware of their differences. Next up, we have several biome tags that have been removed. Has closer water fog, increased fire burnout, plays underwater music, snow golem melts, and without patrol spawn. Now, as always, if you were referencing those tags, you can just go ahead and redefine them in your own data pack, but their functionality has been moved away from the tag system to this brand new thing called the environment attribute system, which is by far this version's biggest change, and I wouldn't be surprised if most of you are here for this. The environment attribute system has not only, you know, just removed these five tags, it's also completely overhauled most of how biomes and dimension types work. Now, this change is massive. Okay, I'm gonna be really clear with you, I'm gonna be really blunt with you. This is not a change that's easy to just upgrade one to one. It would be really hard for me to sit here and list out every single way in which, oh, if you had this in the previous version, you now need to do this in the new version. Because first of all, it's just so huge. And second of all, there's a couple instances where doing that is just not so straightforward. So I thought I would at least start by explaining the system, giving you a couple examples, and then pointing you to all of the resources you might need to engineer your own upgrade for yourself. I genuinely think that will be more helpful to you than if I just sat here and tried to list every way in which you might need to upgrade. So here's how the environment attribute system works. You can either pause the video here as I scroll through my little write-up of the system, or you can listen to me explain it. Really up to you. So in both dimension types as well as biomes, a lot of these config fields have been moved to a new location and had their names changed. Both biomes and dimension types have this new field called attributes, which is just a really big object full of a whole bunch of stuff, and these attributes are just various things that affect how the environment works, basically. I mean, they're called environment attributes for a reason. A very simple example is how in the previous version we had cloud height, which was just an integer, and now under attributes we've got this Minecraft visual slash cloud height, which is a decimal, and is almost the same as it was before, but they've added a 0.33 for some reason. Several of those fields can be upgraded directly in that way, but again, not all of them. Like for example, before we had bed works and then also respawn anger works, the bed works field has been upgraded to this new attribute under attributes called bed rule, which is an object that allows you to toggle when you can set your spawn, when you can sleep, and then the respawn anchor works rule has just been upgraded to an attribute called respawn anchor works, which is still a boolean. I'll be providing a link down below to the wiki page about all of these environment attributes, and you can scroll through them and see what they all do. Hopefully that'll give you a pretty good idea of how to actually upgrade what you had before to this new system. One thing you'll notice is that as I scroll through this attributes field, still under the overworld dimension type, you'll see some settings that actually look very similar to the way biomes worked before. So we've got 
Fog color, sky color, these were both biome fields before. As well as a new cloud color, so you can change the color of clouds. That's brand new, that's pretty cool. The really cool thing about these attributes is that for most of them, with like two exceptions, everything that can go under biomes can also go under dimension types and vice versa. So fog color and sky color, well these were previously biome only, but now you can specify them, you know, still in the biomes, but also in the dimension types if you want to. Biomes take priority over dimension types, so if you specify the same thing in both the dimension type and a biome inside that dimension, the biome will take priority. And just so you have a little bit more context, I've also gone ahead and pulled out the vanilla Badlands biome and then, you know, also trimmed it down a bit so it's less visually overstimulating. But you can see it also has this new attributes field and it's got stuff like the background music. It overrides the sky color. So you saw that the sky color in the dimension file was set to something. The sky color in this biome file is now a little bit different. So this will actually override the dimension setting. And not all biomes have that. If a biome doesn't have it, it will just default to the one that was listed in the dimension, which is one of the really cool things about this new system. We've also got this attribute called gameplay slash snow golem melts, which as we saw was previously controlled by that biome tag that got removed. If you can't already tell, this is basically just an overhaul to like most of the things that appear in dimensions and biomes. And like I said, scrolling through the wiki to see all of these attributes and the options associated with them will probably allow you to upgrade much faster than sitting here listening to me explaining would. Here are all the wiki pages that I think are really important to read in order to understand this system. It is really just like learning a new language. As I've said before, I'll be leaving this data pack that I'm working out of in the description, and I'll also put all of these links in the description directly as well if you want to just click them really fast. It might also be really helpful to just go through the vanilla files and familiarize yourself with this system. And I covered how to access the vanilla files in a previous video that I will link up in the top corner right now if you want to click on that and see how to do that. And with that, I will leave you with, uh, Godspeed. I believe in you. You've got this. I have been Kanye, and thank you so much for watching. Uh, that is it for our changes. I hope this video has been helpful to you in some way. Let me know if it was. I will see you later, my dudes.